This is going to be a great session with lots of great information on how to ensure your furry companion is always on her best behavior. This talk will begin with an introduction from our friends at Skedaddle, who can make sure that the wildlife around your home is on their best behavior as well. May I introduce you to Ryan from Skedaddle Wildlife Control, our sponsor for the speaker series. Welcome, Ryan. Thank you, Heather. Yeah, I'm, I'm Ryan Rainville uh, from Skedaddle Humane Wildlife Control. Uh, this is, you know, we're getting into the, some of the colder months, but still a really active time of year for, for urban wildlife. Um, and you can visit our blog to learn a little bit more about how we look to reduce stress when interacting with wildlife that might be, you know, living on your property or living inside your home or attic. Um, you can also learn a little bit more there about, you know, what urban wildlife is going to be up to as they, we get into to some of these colder months. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce our guest speaker, Andrea Cormier, to talk about creating a stress-free environment for your pet. Andrea Cormier graduated from Sheridan College in 2012 and became a registered veterinary technician. She began her career working in shelter medicine, gaining a wealth of medical and behavioral experience during her eight-year tenure. Andrea now works at a fast-paced vet clinic doing anesthesia, x-rays, and caring for the many medical cases that come through the doors. Andrea loves all the aspects of being a registered veterinary tech. Uh, learning and sharing her knowledge is one of her passions. In 2019, she became Fear Free certified and has completed both levels one and two of the Fear Free program. Or excuse me, has completed levels one and two. The Fear Free program provides professionals and pet lovers with knowledge to look after both a pet's physical and emotional well-being. Being Fear Free certified has helped Andrew realize the daily stresses that animals, pet owners, and veterinary care staff experience. Andrea regularly provides education to clients and coworkers on ways to reduce stress and enrich animals' lives. Andrea shares her home with two dogs, Duke and Ivy, and three cats, Griffin, Snowman, and Chase. They're all, they were all adopted from the Oakville and Milton Humane Society. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you so much. I am very excited to be here today so i'm gonna get started i do apologize in advance i think my cat is uh in the background meowing so i'm sorry in advance so let's get started uh we have lots of fun information for today all right so let's get started uh, so we're going to do talk about stress reduction for your pet uh, tonight. Also, this cat is so cute. Um, looks exactly like my cat I have now, Griffin. Um, so what we're going to talk about tonight's session, uh, so what does stress look like for your pet? Um, so originally when I was making this presentation, um, I kind of started to think about it. Most presentations are geared uh, mostly towards just dogs and cats. Uh, but a lot of people have other pets other than dogs and cats, so I did want to touch on them as well. So I will discuss some pocket pets um, and birds and such as, and stuff like that as well. Uh, we're going to also talk about the importance of enrichment, enrichment for your pet, um, how to reduce your pet stress at the vet, um, stress reduction during new and stressful situations, and how to help your pet adjust to work at the office again. Uh, so what does stress look like? Stress looks different for all species. It is important to know what stress looks like for your pet. This will help you to determine how your pet feels in new situations. Cats. Cats are incredibly sensitive creatures um, and they're very sensitive to stressful situations. And once they get stressed, it is very difficult to kind of bring them down from that stressor. So it's best to try and avoid the stressor um, the best you can. So it is common for cats to hide and be distant when new people come to the home. Uh, cats typically will use their ears, their tail, and vocalize more during stressful situations. Uh, once cats get stressed, like I said, it can take a few hours for them to relax again. Um, a panting cat is a very stressed cat. A cat panting should be removed from the stressor as soon as possible. This is one of the most common things you'll see at a vet clinic. Um, I see it quite often, unfortunately, where a cat comes in, you pull it out of the carrier, super stressed, panting, and immediately I'm always like, guys, we got to get this cat into a quiet room and just let it relax before we can do anything with it. 
So here are some photos here of some cats um, with different body language. So the pair of cats um, on the screen here are very relaxed. You can tell because their whiskers are very kind of, they're just relaxed. They're not pulled back. Their pupils aren't dilated. They're nice almond shape. Their ears are forward um, and they're alert because you can tell they're obviously looking at something for this photo. Um, and their paws are relaxed as well because they're kind of little, they're loafing on a bed it looks like, right? Then you look at this other cat. This cat here is terrified. Let's be serious. Um, its pupils are uh, extremely dilated. Um, its whiskers are a little bit pulled back. You can tell it's hiding maybe under a couch or um, in a bed of some sort trying to keep away from people. Um, so this is what you want to avoid, right? So when you have new people come over, and obviously this is going to start happening more again. I mean, for the last year and a half or so, we really haven't had a ton of new people in our homes. We've pretty much just been spending it with our family um, and our bubble. So now we're going to have more people come in, the more we're more comfortable with that. And pets are going to have to adjust to that. And these are the body languages that we are going to have to pay attention to. So this, I thought this meme was hilarious because it's so accurate, right? So a dog will show its body language um, outright, right? So the moody dog is, you know, giving this body language. The anxious dog is showing it because its ears are bent down a different way. An excited dog, you can tell it's probably wagging its tail. But cats, like, I mean, they don't like to show their body language and how they're feeling, right? So they... A moody cat might look the exact same as an anxious cat, uh, might look the exact same as an excited cat, and it could just be something as small as an ear twitch that kind of changes them. So, for dogs. Dogs show their stress in many ways. Um, it can be very subtle, or it can be very obvious. If your dog's yeah. stress does become too much, it's important to remove them from the situation as soon as possible. So those are situations like, um, you know, if your kids have friends come over and you start to notice your dog's getting stressed, it's important to stop the interactions just so it doesn't escalate to something that we don't want it to. Um, dogs seem to adjust better to stress than cats, and they can also be convinced with food. They're much more food motivated than cats. Sometimes we can change their perspective on situations with food as well and help to reduce their stress even further by making it a positive experience. So, for example, um, if a dog comes in at work um, and it is a little bit stressed, I can tell its body language is a little bit stressed, but, and I pull out the cheese whiz jar, um, I, our ACAs probably hate me because I smear cheese whiz on literally everything, but I can do, like, take a nervous dog and change its entire behavior based on some cheese whiz smeared on a wall, be able to get vaccines into it and everything with very little stress, do a full nail trim. Uh, just a little bit of food motivation and uh, positive reinforcement, making that a more positive experience. So here are some photos. Um, so this dog here on the couch, this is your relaxed dog. Maybe it's relaxed. You're watching some movies with it. It looks quite content, right? It's uh, sitting there pretty relaxed. Its ears aren't back. Its ears are forward and relaxed. Its whiskers um, and its like mouth is nice and relaxed. Its tail isn't tucked. It has some pretty nice body language there. This other photo here I thought was um, a good photo to use because this a lot of people might have seen this with their dogs and uh, meeting new people, right? So you can tell that this dog is very anxious by its body language. It's lowering it to the ground. Um, its ears are back. Its mouth is a little bit tight. Um, its eyes, it's giving uh, what looks like children some side eye. So it's kind of being like, you know what, this is a lot for me. So this is also, a, this is a stressed dog. So this is a dog that if you were meeting it and you saw this body language, you need to stop and not pet it and back off and pull it away from that situation. So I love putting memes in because I feel like it really spices up the, the talk. So what stress, what does stress look like? I've got everything under control and we've all we've all felt this way and we've all seen this pet when we've bathed it so this pet is obviously stressed because it's i mean it doesn't enjoy its bath but its pupils are dilated um and it's just doesn't look overall happy but it's cute in this photo so i thought too i wanted to definitely cover some just basic body language for you guys because not everybody knows what stress looks like for their pet right like for example, the stress yawn. 
most pet owners will mistake this for exhaustion and we hear that all the time at the vet clinic so the the dog will give out a huge yawn in the exam room and they'll go, oh it, it's just tired because we just went we walked here um no probably your dog is trying to tell you that it's stressed um by using that big yawn and this is a nice subtle cue that you can watch for in different situations like out on walks um meeting new people when you have gatherings stuff like that just to kind of watch for that yawn and you can tell that this dog is definitely stressed based on its body language this here uh panting so this dog is definitely um stressed so you can tell because it is panting first of all so and its lips are pulled back it's because you can see all of its teeth um it's giving you a little bit of side eye a little whale eye so it's kind of peering off to the side and kind of watching you its ears are back um so this dog is very stressed and it's panting not because of excessive exercise or heat but because it's stressed so a lot of pet owners with dogs um have probably seen this in a vet in a vet clinic when you have your dog there for its appointment it's probably doing some some yawning um and some panting and probably right now you're probably thinking back like yep yeah i've definitely seen that so this is a very common uh just body language that a dog might give and i see it all the time it's always that like crazy frenchie that comes back for a nail trim um it's got its lips pulled all the way back it's panting and now we have to give it a nail trim and that's when i pull out my cheese whiz and try and uh, cheese whiz it up to kind of help with uh, that stress so this here not the most common thing that you're going to see but sometimes if you have a nervous pet you might have seen this already so freezing um and most pets will do this freezing before they give you a good warning sign to say back off i've had enough or kind of pancaking to the ground and a lot of people might have seen this getting their pet into a vet clinic right um so this is a more extreme stress cue so not all pet owners may have seen this unless you have an overall nervous pet um and sometimes you can change their their mind and convince them to come into treats but sometimes you can't and you kind of have to abort mission and try again another day um so i would consider both freezing and dropping down to the ground a very significant stress cue uh this should be respected and you should be trying to reduce your dog's stress sometimes in these situations you can spend time with your dog uh, with some yummy treats and reassurance but if you can't convince them like i said it's time to abort mission and try it again another day i know sometimes that's not 100 percent possible especially with like appointments and stuff like that with your vet but it's always a good idea to talk with your veterinarian about reducing your pet stress and they can help you do that by giving you either prescriptions or kind of talk you through the next step so let's take a look at this and most people have seen this probably um maybe now during curbside when someone new has tried to leash up your dog and get it into the vet clinic uh and you kind of see them kind of lay on the ground and they won't walk for them so this here kind of you're freezing um or you're getting low to the ground or pancaking as a lot of um, veterinary professionals call it um so you can tell that both these dogs are very stressed um, very nervous their ears are down and back um they're low to the ground they're just they don't want to they don't want to walk i mean you might be able to for this little puppy on the side here convince it with some treats maybe make a, a food trail for it and get it into the clinic or into your house or however wherever you're trying to get it you might be able to but you might also just have to abort mission and try again another day unfortunately um so vocalizing um so whining or whimpering is probably the most common vocalization heard by most pet owners uh when their dog is in a stressful situation so you can usually pair this with the with the big stress yawn so usually you'll get like you know that the whining whimpering and then they'll give like this big yawn but like a dramatic yawn with like a like a whine in it and you're kind of like yeah yeah no you're definitely stressed um and uh of course, I used a Frenchie because that's what we see a lot of at the clinic I work at, and they're always worked up when I see them. So, uh, yeah, so vocalizing, whining, whimpering, also common. Sometimes you'll get barking, um, but that's usually more in situations where they're trying to really tell you to back off, trying to make themselves look scary for you to back off. So, like I said, I wanted to cover some uh, other 
animals other than dogs and cats because a lot of um, stuff is really just based on dogs and cats where you know what people do have other pets that have stress and it's important to recognize that and even if you're a pet sitter or um, you have a friend with these types of pets it's important to also recognize these uh, stress cues for them as well so small pocket pets are very sensitive to stress uh, like cats they don't usually vocalize or express obvious stress cues like dogs and cats. Um, typically, a significant stress cue in these guys is hiding, uh, trying to flee when being handled, and in more stressful situations, oops, sorry, um, in more stressful situations, they may yawn, pace, or even become aggressive. So, you know, when you uh, when you pull out that hamster and you're playing with it and it's trying to scurry away from you, I mean, it could be that it wants to be adventurous but it could also just have had enough and now it's getting stressed and wants to get away. So, like I said, I love a good meme. So, uh, this bunny here is trying to get a good signal with its ear. So, birds. Birds are super, super sensitive to stress. Um, if you're a bird owner, you already know this. Birds can be stressed by the smallest thing. Like, you could put up a Christmas tree and that's it for it and now it's stressed and it's decided to pluck its feathers and it's pacing in its cage and it's hanging out on the bottom. Um, so birds are super, super stressful uh, creatures. Uh, so it's important to note that. Um, also wild birds and domestic birds get stressed super easy. Um, so birds typically will show their stress um, by kind of poofing up their feathers. And I'm sure we've all seen it where you know you see either a wild bird outside or a domestic bird. And they're sitting there, their uh, feathers are all poofed out. They look like they kind of have a big giant feather winter coat on type thing. Um, sometimes they'll pace in their cage, either on the bottom um, or even just on like a perch um, or even just kind of holding onto the bars and using their beaks to kind of pace back and forth. Um, if something is stressing a bird out in any manner, it is important to remove the stressor immediately uh, birds, like I said, super stressed creatures, so they have the tendency to, um, unfortunately, they can pass away from extreme stress. So if you notice your bird is super stressed, cover it up, remove. If you know what this is stressing it out, uh, try to remove that immediately. Um, and like I said, birds can be changed, uh, be stressed by the smallest new environmental change. So even putting in a new toy hanging in their cage and they've decided they don't like it, that can stress them out. So here's some photos of some kind of a happy bird and a super stressed out bird. So a bird sitting on the bottom of a cage, very concerning. Um, you should speak with your veterinarian if your bird is sitting on the bottom of the cage immediately, as well as if you think it's from an environmental stressor, get that out of there immediately. But also um, a bird sitting on the bottom of its cage poofed up like this, uh, definitely you should speak with your veterinarian. Uh, this budgie on the other side here, though, looks super relaxed. I mean, he's... He's just hanging out, living his best life in his cage here, probably, you know, anticipating flying around that room there. All right, so let's talk about enrichment. Um, enrichment is huge for pets. Um, so physical activity is great for your pet and can help with maintaining physical health, but sometimes it, it doesn't always enrich them mentally. Mental stimulation is very important for all types of pets and can dramatically reduce stress in the home. So let's be honest here. We're going into the cold months. Um, it's win it's winter. We're not going to probably get our pet our dogs out walked as much as we would like to because a it's freezing, it's icy, um, poor weather conditions, and so we really have to work on different ways to kind of burn that energy. And doing it mentally is very important, and it it, it can be super fun for both you and your your pet. So um, I wanted to use some other is like, you know, animal pictures for enrichment because it's animal enrichment is important for all types of animals. So here is a giraffe here getting some enrichment um, and using its natural behaviors to kind of forage and get a snack. Right. So enrichment allows animals to use their natural behaviors. This will help them use their brains in different ways. There are a few different areas of enrichment that are beneficial to animals. So there's a few different types of enrichment. Uh, there's cognitive enrichment. Uh, so this is using positive reinforcement to help 
uh, help work their brains. This type of enrichment would be commonly used for training purposes. Uh, sensory enrichment. Uh, so using different types of scents to enrich an animal's life. Many animals enjoy different types of scents. Um, animals also like different types of sounds. Using pre-recorded sounds are great for auditory enrichment. Food. Food is the most used type of enrichment um, by pet owners. Creating different types of food toys and puzzles can provide a pet with a ton of mental stimulation. Uh, basic toys. All pet owners have tons of toys. Picking out toys not only brings your pet's joy, it also brings the pet owner's joy finding toys for their pet. All right, so cognitive enrichment. Uh, using positive reinforcement for training and teaching your pet new things is not only going to help mentally stimulate them, but also to help you build a stronger bond. So that's, you know, training, um, going to puppy class, going to dog class, doing all sorts of different things with your pet, uh, doing training walks, stuff like that. Um, not only dogs can learn, not only dogs can learn tricks, many cats, birds, and some pocket pets can also learn fun tricks and greatly benefit from time spent teaching them. So for example, um, a, lot, a lot of parrots um, will learn like, you know, do food puzzles and stuff like that. So you can buy food puzzles and they'll learn how to uh, get their treats out of the puzzle and that helps to mentally enrich them. Birds, super important that you mentally enrich them or else they get stressed and start feather plucking and that's a whole other problem. Um, so same with rats. Rats love a good maze and you can use treats to train them to do mazes. Although training is fun and rewarding, it is very important not to overdo it and take many breaks so not to overwhelm your pet. And sometimes you'll see that when you're, say, you're working with a new puppy and you're training them to, you know, sit, lie down and do all those things. And then eventually you kind of see them like reach maximum capacity and they've had enough. So it's important to know when to stop. Um, so sensory enrichment. So sensory enrichment is uh, very important as well. Um, and it has very, it has tons of benefits to it. So many pets enjoy different scents and it is super easy to do. Even just a small amount of a scent spray on your pet's bed can enrich them. Um, if your pet really begins to enjoy different types of scents, you can even um, investigate scent-based courses and classes for you and your pet to do together. Lots of pets enjoy the sound of nature. Owners can use pre-recorded sounds and play them in the background for their pets. This can help when pets are home alone or even during stressful situations such as thunderstorms and fireworks. So a lot of cats love the smell of vanilla. Vanilla is one of those scents that for some reason dogs and cats really like, but cats in particular really enjoy vanilla. So even just taking some regular vanilla extract, diluting it in water and putting it in one of these just like dollar store spray bottles and spraying it on, um, you know, a piece of fabric or something um, and putting it on their bed, that can enrich them dramatically. And even for dogs are the same. Like I said, you can get into super fancy things where, uh, you know, you go to scent classes and learn how to do scenting activities, which is not only going to, you know, be fun for your dog and mentally stimulate them, but you're going to grow a stronger bond because you guys are going to work together and it's going to be fun, right? And obviously this person here has uh, a whole weekly regimen of different smells for their pet. So because we're listening to music, <laughs> I had to find this meme. Um, so food enrichment. Uh, food enrichment is probably the most common type of enrichment out there, right? Everybody out there has Kongs um, that they stuff or they have food toys, stuff like that. Um, so obviously food enrichment is the is one of the easiest ones to do. And then but food can be made into so many different homemade enrichment toys um, and all different difficulty levels. And you can even start small um, with something and then build on it which is really beneficial for your pets. So you could do something as small as just taking an old used Tim Hortons bag, throwing a handful of kibbles in it and letting your dog shred it to get the kibbles out. And that's the beginning of it. And then maybe you bounce, you get it more intense and you start crumpling up paper and putting it in an Amazon box and hiding treats in there. And they have to pull out all the paper to get to its treats. And that takes more time. And then even you can build on that further where you actually close the box. They have to open the box and get to their treats, right? So you can really build on it. 
Um, and the internet has so many different recipes and toy ideas, right? So you can make popsicles, um, catsicles. I've also made um, small animal popsicles. They love it with a little bit of diluted like apple juice. So there's totally a, the, the internet. Just use it the best you can to find all the things you want to do to enrich your pet's life. And even using old pizza boxes, smearing a little bit of cheese whiz or peanut butter in there, stick some kibbles on it, let them let them lick it off. You're uh, they're gonna be there forever. I mean, it can get a little messy, but it's worth it in the end. So I thought I would include some photos of some different enrichment here. So we have a bunny here. Looks like it's a homemade enrichment uh, style thing. So they probably purchased, you know, it looks like maybe glasses or something like that. And then they just filled all the holes with different types of things. So they have the toilet paper roll stuff with greens. That is like one of the best things to do for small animals because everyone has toilet paper rolls at home, especially during the pandemic. Um, so you can just stuff it with some good greens and then they can work to get them out. And then there's different types of toys there. There's um, toys with balls in it, toys like that squeak, different uh, textures. Um, this bird over here, it looks like maybe it's like an African gray uh, bird. Um, so this is a, a food toy for a bird. So basically um, an owner has filled this toy with different treats for this bird and it has to spin it to get its snacks out. So now we're mentally stimulating this bird. It's also getting a food enrichment um, and it's going to be a happy bird. This down here, uh, a dog, super easy. You just buy some tennis balls from the dollar store. You um, get a dollar store muffin tin. Um, throw some kibbles in the bottom of it and cover it up with the tennis balls. Um, and your dog just has to pull them out to find it, right? So it's, it's super cheap, super fun, super easy. And I mean, like I said, you can get fancy with it if you want. And the muffin tins make uh, great molds to make popsicles with, I have learned. So um, I thought, why not include a Kong recipe? Everybody has Kongs for their dogs. Not all pets like Kongs. Um, we wish they did. Everyone loves um, that every pet would love them. Um, but here's a different recipe for you instead of that traditional, you know, uh, peanut butter canned food mixture. So you can either take a picture of this uh, slide. Um, I did get it from this German Shepherd uh, website and they had a whole bunch of different options on there. So go check it out and they have lots of cool stuff on that website but um, this one does sound quite good and it's stuff that you would just usually have at home and uh, you don't have to go out kind of shopping for all right so basic toys um, so the important so everyone enjoys walking through the pet store and picking out the, that perfect toy for their pet right and you can even nowadays get uh, pet toy boxes so I get a uh, the traditional bark box for my dogs every month, um, and as well as I get a cat toy box every month for my cat. So once a month, I get um, catnip toys for it's called a kitnip box, um, and then for my dogs, I get a bark box. So every month, uh, they get their toys uh, and they get enriched that way, and they love it. Um, Duke is really bad though because he knows now what the bark box is, opens it himself, so that's enrichment for him, but also. I don't appreciate when he opens my mail for me. So, um, so, but it is important to make sure it's a safe size and to supervise your pet with new toys to make sure that they don't get into too much trouble because there's a good potential that if it's too small um, or if you're not watching them closely, they can swallow it whole. Um, unfortunately, I see it all the time at a vet clinic. Uh, we end up inducing vomiting on, you know, a dog that ate an entire stuffed toy and then you have to kind of induce vomiting before it becomes a problem so watching closely so here's some more examples of just some basic toys that you can pick up at a store so we have small animal ones here they love to chew sticks right because they have constantly growing teeth so they have to constantly work on those teeth so all these toys you just find at any old pet store on amazon for your hamsters and your rabbits and your uh, little gps there um cats love these springs find them at the dollar store i don't know what it is like they love these springs I mean, you're going to spend the next six months, like, fishing them out from underneath your uh, couch and your fridge, but they're totally worth it because they absolutely love them. Um, and those, like, funny little finger trap-like ones, they love those. You can go get those anywhere, too. And then dog toys. 
they usually have some pretty cool enrichment ones there. Like you can see the squirrel that comes out of the tree trunk uh, one, the classic Kong, um, and just like, you know, the food shaped ones. Um, and then obviously you have your chuck it balls if your dog is like likes to fetch, right? All right, so let's talk about uh, pets going to the vet. Um, so we all do it. We all have to take our pets to the vet. You have to go for different reasons. Maybe they're just going for an annual exam. Uh, maybe they're going because they're sick. I mean, there's there's many different reasons why you're going to a veterinarian, right? And maybe you're just going in for a casual weigh-in. So you just, regardless of the reason that you're going, you just want to make it a positive experience for your pet. So, um, so getting them ready to head to the vet. So one of the most stressful moments for a lot of animals is getting them to the vet. Dogs typically transport more willingly, but it is still important to make it positive. Use treats and food motivation. If you have a small animal or bird, it is important to keep them covered with a towel during transport to reduce stress. Cats get their whole, the, like their own slide because they get super stressed uh, when they go to the vet. Uh, so if you have a cat, it's very beneficial to leave your carrier out and allow them to get used to it. This will make transporting them much more positive, make it a much more positive experience if they're used to seeing it out in a common area or, or even used to sp spending time in it. The cat carrier should be placed on the floor of the vehicle behind the passenger seat. There's less vibration there, causing less movement during transport. So I used this picture here of this cat with this um, carrier. These carriers, they're kind of newer, I guess. Um, they're, they're great because you don't actually have to remove the cat out of the cage and kind of go through that process of kind of hauling them out or waiting for them to kind of walk out on their own. The whole thing kind of slides out and you can just do the whole exam inside of this carrier, um, which is great for the cat because it reduces their stress. But going back to the benefits of leaving your cat carrier out. So if you think about it, the last time you took your cat to the vet, um, you probably went through a series of different things. You probably went down to the basement, um, pulled out the cat carrier, dusted it off, brought it upstairs, um, left it on the floor. Your cat saw it and was like, oh my goodness, this is never good. Um, you may or may not have put like a, you know, a fresh blanket inside or sometimes they already have the liners in them. So it kind of still smells like the last time they were there. So they're like, oh, I'm definitely not going near that now. Um, and it's likely that you probably then were like, hey, well, I had to put you in this. And you've now probably had to chase them around the house to kind of catch them. You put them in the carrier. They're not happy. And so right off the bat, they're already stressed. They're like, oh, my gosh, this is the worst. I'm going on an adventure and I hate it. So already they're stressed. So if you leave that carrier out, make it a positive experience, put a bed in it, put treats in it, um, put catnip in it and let them just get used to it. And even maybe it just kind of lives you know, out in a common area all the time and makes it a positive experience. Similar to like how you have a dog crate uh, for your dog if you crate train it, right? Um, do that with your cat and they're probably gonna, they're probably gonna adjust much better to that experience than doing the whole chasing them around, trying to catch them, put them in it, and then you put them in the back of your car type thing. So once you're at the vet, it is important to keep it positive from the very beginning for your pet. Bringing their favorite treats with you can really help uh, make the vet visit a more positive experience. Uh, many clinics are already using positive re reinforcement and are using fear-free techniques already, which will help reduce your pet's stress. If you feel your pet is stressed when at the vet, some clinics provide happy visits. So these visits are visits where you um, go to your vet clinic and the clinic staff literally do zero medical on your pet. Um, all they do is they literally just flood your dog or your cat with just pets, love, um, kibble, treats, stuff like that. Um, oh, sorry. Um, so those are beneficial. Not all vet clinics offer them. So it's worth asking if your clinic provides that. Um, and then... Like I said, you're just, your pet's going to come in, get love. Obviously, they're going to read the body language. If they're overwhelming them, they're going to stop. But these visits are great. Um, we occasionally offer them at the clinic I work at. And the, there's a huge difference between how that dog kind of comes in. It's usually dogs. Um, and like at their first visit, and then when they keep coming in for the diff more happy visits, by the time they make it into an actual appointment, they're much more willing to let you kind of touch them and spend time with them. Um, so yeah, try that. Talk to your vet about that. 
Um, and for the treats, if you have a nervous dog, make it a good high value treat um, or cat if your cat is food motivated. Um, you can try things like cheese whiz too, hot dogs, cheese, um, some good stuff to make it a positive experience because going to the vet is a lifelong thing. It's not a one time deal, right? You need to go to the vet at least once a year and more uh, depending on if your pet has an ailment. Um, so it's important to make it very positive for everybody because it's stressful for not only you, um, obviously for your pet, but it's also stressful on the veterinary team if your pet is stressed because then they are anxious as well. So try to keep the whole thing positive. So here are some different ways to distract your pet at the vet. Uh, so here um, is little Miso. She uh, belongs to one of the vets I work with. Uh, she was actually also adopted from the Humane Society. Um, and she loves treats. Like the other day we did a, we did all her vaccines and everything, uh, by feeding her little pieces of, uh, freeze dried chicken. Um, and then this one here commonly also used, uh, this Boston is uh, also licking a lick mat. Um, like I said, I smear cheese whiz on everything. Um, I have been able to vaccinate dogs using cheese whiz that no one at the clinic was able to vaccinate before using um, she's whiz and I literally can walk in smeared on the floor do a full set of vaccines sometimes I can even get a full nail trim in uh, while they're just licking uh, cheese whiz off the floor um, and then if your dog is does like a good Kong um, you can bring a Kong for them to work through um, while they're getting their exam you can see here it looks like they're applying a bandage to this dog also great food distraction you can do so many things to dogs uh, with food it's actually it's crazy so if you find your pet is over the top stressed um, and, you know, food isn't working, um, using kind of pheromone treatment isn't working and you're just you're just finding that the whole experience is too much for your pet. That is totally OK, but it is also very important that you speak with your veterinarian about that because they can provide you with um, medications for to, to make it a better experience for everybody. Right. So. If you just find that your pet is just anxious and it's making you anxious and everybody's stressed, speak with your vet and they can help you out and get you some uh, some medication or give you some tips and tricks on how to reduce that stress. All right, so facing stressful situations. So meeting new people. Like I said, this is going to start happening more. Um, so meeting new people is something many new puppies, kittens, and other pets are adjusting to every day. It is important to make this a very positive experience from the moment that person walks into the animal's life. Using food treats is the easiest way to most animals' hearts. Make sure the new visitor goes slow and is giving lots of treats, making it a positive experience for your pet. So this is where it's important for you to know those stress cues. So the stress yawn, the panting, um, whining, um, trying to scurry away. Those are the situations that now you're like, okay, now I have to watch because this is a new person. So if at any point your pet is trying to flee, hide, or starts to get anxious during the visit with your friends, let them leave the situation. It won't be a positive experience for anyone if the pet is so stressed it is trying to hide from everything. Just let your visitors know that it is too much and your pet needs a break. So that, and usually you'll see this with cats. Um, mostly you'll kind of, um, when people come, Sorry, my dogs just interrupted this presentation. Um, so, um, so usually you'll mostly see that with cats, uh, where they're going to hide um, under the couch or try and flee uh, that way. Uh, fireworks. Uh, so fireworks are beautiful to watch, but can be quite offensive to our pets. If you anticipate fireworks are going to be set off during the evening hours, um, it may be beneficial to take your dog out for a walk earlier in the evening. So on your typical holidays that you hear more, um, so like, you know, your Victoria Day, um, your Canada Day, days like that. Um, so try and get your dog out for that earlier walk um, just to avoid the darkness and the loud, uh, obviously, sounds from the fireworks. Um, so this also helps because knowing those kind of those key dates, you can pre-prepare some frozen enrichment items or toys so your dog has something to focus on for an extended period of time. Uh, maybe turn on some quiet classical music or a movie and sit with them 
So maybe go down into a basement uh, where it's quieter, uh, away from all the loud sounds, um, and give them those food treats, uh, those enrichment toys, um, and make it a very positive experience. Um, you can also use a thunder shirt to help with the stress of the noise. And in the next slide, I'll talk about th thunder shirts. Um, if you find your pet is severely affected by fireworks, like I said, always speak with your uh, veterinarian about it, right? So if you are finding that they are severely um, anxious and stressed and terrified, that's okay, but just make sure you speak with your veterinarian and they can help you out with some different things that can help reduce that stress. All right, so thunder shirts. What is a thunder shirt? So a thunder shirt is a snug fitting piece of pet clothing that helps by placing pressure on the dog or cat's body to help with stress reduction. So they do have them for dogs and cats. Uh, research has shown that this type of constant pressure helps with the body to release calming hormones such as oxytocin and endorphins. So you can see here uh, two different types of dogs. We have our Frenchie, um, who I think are probably naturally just anxious creatures um, uh, with its thunder shirt on. Thunder shirts do have to fit quite snugly. Um, so when you do buy most people like that are selling them can help you uh, fit them properly. And then you see this Dalmatian here who has a thunder shirt on also who is confidently now walking out on a walk, right? So we don't know what both of these dogs were like before, um, but obviously the thunder shirt is really helping relax them. Um, so thunderstorms. So thunderstorms are difficult because you can't always pre-prepare for your bad weather. But this is where it's beneficial to just have pre-frozen toys in your freezer. So just having Kongs um, frozen before or uh, popsicles, stuff like that, that you can pull out. Um, but if you do know that bad weather is coming that day, you can use that thunder shirt um, and put it on in advance. Um, or you can speak with your veterinarian about, you know, medications if it's a severe one and you can get those medications into them beforehand. Um, but it is a good idea to pay close attention to the weather forecast if your pet is affected by uh, thunderstorms. Um, like I said, uh, like fireworks, having pre-frozen toys prepared is ideal. Um, and then trying to go into like a quieter area, so maybe a basement, something like that, with that music, those movies, those TV shows, just to kind of relax with them. Um, and like I said, if your pet is greatly affected by loud noises um, and needs help further, speak with your veterinary team because they are going to be more than helpful um, and they're going to get you the ways, like the best things to help reduce that stress for your pet. <laughs> Halloween. So trick or treating. We all recently experienced this. Um, so Halloween is a very stressful night for pets. Um, there are spooky decorations, strange costumes, people coming to the door and lots of foot traffic outside the house. I don't know about your dogs, but for about the entire month of October, when I was out walking my dogs, I do have one dog that's, he's kind of, he's kind of anxious. He's kind of um, a sensitive guy. He's a big guy too, which is funny. Um, but there was a few houses that had like spooky ghosts, like hanging out of their trees. And he stopped in his tracks so many times and was like, oh my goodness, this is, this is a lot, mom. And you could tell that his body language changed. And then once he realized like it wasn't coming at him, He's like, okay, we can carry on. Um, but I did have to reassure him some mornings when we're out on our walks. Um, but there are a few options for Halloween. You can have a designated family member to hand out, uh, hang out with the pets in a quiet room or basement away from all the excitement. Uh, this will keep their stress the lowest, give them a yummy treat and lots of toys to keep them busy. Uh, use a lot of treats if you plan to make your pet part of the evening's events. Use a high value yummy treat so they associate the many people in costumes with positive experience. If you feel your pet is very stressed in situations like this, with many people coming to the door, speaking with your veterinarian about options to help with stress reduction is ideal. It is important to know when your pet has had enough of, the ha of Halloween and, um, and put them away in a quiet area to avoid unwanted overstimulation, which in some cases can lead to unpleasant behaviors or even bites. So like I said, it's just a lot of uh, stimulation for the night. So a lot of people knocking on your doors, ringing your doorbells, coming to your door. That's a lot for a pet to adjust to and a lot of strangers. Especially the number of strangers, you can't really kind of provide, you know, treats to hand out to your dogs and your cats.
um, large gatherings. So if you have nervous pets um, and you know you have a nervous pet, but maybe you learn at this event that your pet is now nervous, um, it may be beneficial to put them in a quiet room away from all the excitement. And I know a lot of people might be, you know, feel like that might be more stressful for the pet because they're locked away. But in reality, if your pet is truly that nervous um, and anxious around people, they're going to appreciate it more than uh, kind of hanging out with a large group. Um, let your guests know how to properly greet your pets. Uh, keep treats out for your guests to have access to, to give to your pets. Um, obviously, also, it's important to talk to your guests if your pets have food allergies to uh, to respect that as well. So don't give them table scraps and stuff like that. Um, and then make sure your guests are watching the doors when entering and exiting to avoid escapees. Um, obviously, because your pets are going to be trying to flee because they're stressed and get away, there's a good chance that they might try and escape out of a door. So that's important to remind your guests as well. Um, if you feel it is too overwhelming for your pet to be out, set them up with some fun enrichment away from the stress of the people. Or, um, like I said, speak to the veterinarian about uh, some medication options when people come over, because that'll also help. So going back to work, um, it is that time people are beginning to go back to the office, which means your pets may be left at home for the first time alone since the pandemic started. And there are lots of people out there that are facing this now. Um, so there are a few options to help with the stress during this time. You can always hire a pet sitter or a dog walker to come in to see your pets while you're at work. Uh, that's a perfect thing to do. Have someone come in midday, take your dog out for a walk, because maybe they're used to going out now like as often as they can, right? So they're used to going out in between each of those Zoom meetings. They're used to going in and outside like every time you get up to take a break from sitting at the computer. So Hiring someone to come in midday to take them for a short walk is great. Um, you can also freeze toys to make the treats last longer in them. So those frozen Kongs are ideal um, to help keep them occupied for longer periods of time. Um, using music in the background, like I had talked about earlier, um, so you can get pre-recorded uh, sounds. So you can do like, uh, you know, nature sounds. Um, some people leave the TV on for them. Um, I mean, I volunteered a monkey sanctuary and they actually play movies for their monkeys to entertain them. So you can put on a movie for them uh, to watch and on repeat, they really don't care. Um, but if you feel that your pet is very stressed or anxious overall, it is important to talk with your veterinarian and get help. So ways to tell if your pet is uh, over the top anxious or stressed are things like, um, you know, destructions or breaking out of their uh, crates and stuff like that. or if you have a doggy cam and you're watching them, um, just monitoring their body language that way. And that's it, guys. Uh, thanks so much for um, coming. And I really hope everyone enjoyed it. So let me finish this and I will stop sharing. Awesome. Thanks so much, Andrea. That that was great. I know we got a lot of great ideas and I have noticed that some people have posted some questions in the chat, which is awesome. And I did have a couple of questions that were sent to me before the presentation because a couple of people weren't going to be able to make it. Um, so okay. I think we'll go, we'll, we'll go through those now. Um, and if anyone thinks of another question, um, it's not too late to add it to the chat. That's that uh, little bubble in the right hand top of your screen. So uh, one of the questions was, um, I know lots of things like essential oils can be poisonous to cats. Do you have any other scent suggestions or any other resources you can suggest to look up for safe sensory scents for cats? Ah, yes, the uh, toxic essential oils. I have seen a few toxicities uh, recently with pets. So. Um, I think most of the ones that we used when I was in shelter medicine um, were we did the vanilla, which is literally straight vanilla extract that you use for cooking, watered it down in water, put it in a spray bottle. I kid you not, cats love that. Um, we also used uh, chamomile uh, watered down. Uh, we never used anything straight. So everything was always watered down um, in water. So like 10 drops of essential oils to like an entire spray bottle of water. You don't need a ton, um, as well as lavender. Cats seem to really like lavender, but the vanilla seemed to be like the winning 
kind of scent um and the chamomile also a lot of uh, both dogs and cats really enjoyed it and actually i think the staff quite enjoyed it as well so those two but i would definitely stay away from um the stronger ones like uh you know tea tree oil because that is toxic um all of those ones eucalyptus lemongrass those aren't uh ideal ones to use um, and we can certainly look up something and potentially when we send out uh, the information and the um, the video uh, recording, we can see what we can come up with for some resources for you to send along. That shouldn't be a problem either. So perfect. Um, next question. What if the dog's fear is so great that treats no longer work? Oh, yes. That is one. That is when you need to talk to a veterinarian. Um, your veterinarian can definitely um, kind of do a behavioral consult and talk to you about behavioral options. Um, and that also might be time that you start looking into uh, talking with dog trainers because they are trained with behavior and they can help you out as well. But I would definitely, number one on your list, speak with your veterinarian because they're going to be able to help you out uh, with that stress reduction, even if it just starts with some uh, oral medication to help with that stress. And then after that, going through um, some behavior treatments, um, maybe some training classes or even going to uh, an animal behaviorist. But first off, I would speak with your uh, veterinarian. Okay, next question. Um, we have a cat that suffers from separation anxiety and um, the person is going away for seven weeks next year. Are there anything or things that they can do um, to help their cat get ready for that in terms of reducing their stress? Well, I guess um, you can start, I mean, there's always the option of getting your cat a friend if you feel your cat would enjoy a friend. Um, so you could always have two cats, which might help um, your cat friend. Uh, but if that is not in the option, I guess you can, again, talk with your veterinarian about using um, you know, some pheromone treatments uh, like feel away is a great option uh, to help with stress reduction in the home. Uh, so you can talk to your vet about that, as well as there are other medications out there to help with that. And then even trying to use those things like um, the music in the background and stuff like that and see if that helps. But sometimes getting your cat a friend if they're a younger cat might help. Um, older cats are typically set in their ways so they're they'd rather live their best life alone if they don't have a friend but uh, younger cats sometimes will benefit from having a friend okay um we have an older kitty with kidney and heart issues and his brother jumps on him and chases him um, any tips on how to end the behavior and reduce the stress in the situation oh dear okay um I guess maybe try, maybe for the younger cat, maybe you can try some different types of enrichment. So maybe buying some of those springs, see if you can get them some toys to kind of, uh, you know, want to do something else other than harass their poor um, older friend. Um, try some of that. Or you can also get uh, a pheromone called Feel Away Friends that you can speak to your veterinarian about that also helps with that kind of that bonding um with them and see if that helps with that but it's possible that your younger cat is just looking for more like you know enrichment so try using some toys um i mean you cat it has tons of options or just going to the dollar store and getting some cat balls something like that just to kind of help them mentally stimulate more because obviously um your senior kitty isn't really up for wrestling which i don't blame them because i wouldn't want to wrestle with a, a youngin either if i was a senior Okay, um, I have a small dog that barks incessantly when someone comes into the house. He might take a treat from them, but then just continues to bark. I've had one trainer say put him on the leash and another trainer say that it's the worst thing to do. What is your opinion? Um, that is a hard one. And I feel like maybe Heather has a better op answer than I do. <laughs> Um, okay, fair enough. I can have a go at this one. So with respect to, it, it depends on the motivation. It sounds like the dog is afraid of the person arriving and so is barking because he's uncomfortable. 
Uh, typically, I would probably utilize the de-stressor that Andrea suggested, which is start off actually having him or her um, in a separate room at the back somewhere, um, actually have the person coming into the house come in, sit down, be there for a while, um, and then have um, the, the person ignore the dog when the dog comes out um, and have a drag leash on the dog. Uh, again, I'm not sure if the issue is around um, they might actually bite the person. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen and we don't want them to get rewarded or feel overly fearful. Um, and it might literally be just standing in the doorway and you feeding the dog treats for the person sitting in the living room and it may take some time to address overall. Probably biggest suggestion would be to actually get the help of a trainer because they can assess the situation and work with you to develop a plan to help your dog to actually get over the problem. And as Andrea also suggested, sometimes um, speaking to your vet about some medication, if your dog is that anxious that it will only take one treat and then panics, putting distance and adding some medication might be a solution to the problem. But it's a difficult one and you're right. Different trainers have different opinions and part of the reason behind that is is because depending on whether they've seen the behavior or not, they may be interpreting the triggers slightly different. And if the dog is truly fearful, having a leash on the dog sometimes makes it worse because the dog feels that they don't have an option to be able to leave the situation if they need to. So hopefully that was helpful in some way or another. Um, okay, next one. My one-year-old dog is anxious about car rides, resists getting in the car, mostly drools almost immediately, um, is getting better. Um, might thunder shirts help or do you have any other suggestions? So I wonder if the dog, does the, I don't know if the, if the dog gets car sick, that could be what it's associating it with is kind of that nausea. Um, which you could try to, um, sometimes if you let them ride behind the passenger seat, they've shown that there's less vibration, um, in the car. So if you can do it that way, or you can put them in a crate, but also just making it more positive. So not actually driving anywhere. So just start by making it positive. So handing them, giving them treats and making it positive before even going anywhere and just build their confidence before you actually take them on a, a drive and then maybe start by taking them for a short drive around the block and see how they do and take a break and then build up to your longer rides. But at first you just have to make it a positive kind of environment for your pet before actually taking them for a long drive. But if the true cause is the fact that they actually get car sick and they're just nauseous and now they've associated with it, Again, you can speak to their veterinarian about getting the medication before getting in the car to avoid the nausea um, and see if that helps as well. But just make it a positive experience. So treats, um, you know, using pheromones like uh, DAP to, uh, spray to kind of help with that, um, which will help reduce the stress. And then once again, though, if you think that it truly is like a nausea related thing, speak to your veterinarian. Um, does Rescue Remedy help with stress? Yeah, it does help with stress. Um, I don't think it's the best option out there uh, now. I think it was one of the more common things used before. Um, and there are much, there is better options out there now to help if you're just looking for just kind of a natural nutraceutical for stress. Um, and that's another thing you can speak with the veterinarian about, but you can buy a product. Um, it's a spray product and you can buy it at most pet stores now uh, called Adaptil and it is a uh, artificial pheromone and it helps uh, with stress reduction. It does have to, after you spray it, have to sit for at least 10 to 15 minutes because uh, it is alcohol based for the alcohol to evaporate. Uh, but you can use that to spray um, on blankets, um, inside of, you know, dog crates. Uh, even on your clothes in situations like that, um, that would help because if you're looking for more of a, a, just a nutraceutical type quick fix, that might be a better option than uh, rescue remedy. Uh, our cat gets stressed and has been pulling his fur out. This has been going on for months. What can we do to help him stop this? Oh dear. Um, that is tough. First of all, I would definitely start with a vet exam because it could, um, it might not only be stress, it could be other things, could be allergies, could be itchy. It's hard to know why um, it's pulling its hair out. 
uh, but you guess you have to kind of figure out the stressor um, and then speak to the veterinarian about possible medications um, to stop that or if there actually is a, a true medical condition causing the hair to for them to pull it out or the hair loss in general. Um, how old is too old for a cat to get a friend? <laughs> um, I think it really, it really depends on your cat's personality. I mean, I probably wouldn't in introduce, like, a lot of cats, if you're going to get a second cat, first of all, know if your cat kind of seems like the more outgoing cat, um, because some cats are very set in their ways, um, but try and find a cat, like a cat friend in similar age. So if you have like a 17 year old cat, maybe don't get a kitten, maybe get an older friend. Um, but usually like try and find something closer in age. So younger cats kind of stick with younger ones, middle-aged cats kind of stick with that middle-aged category because you don't want to kind of upset that balance. If you have a senior cat that's like nice and quiet and they just like spending their time, you know, laying in that sunbeam and then you go and get a a youngin out there that's just causing a ruckus um, that wants to uh, bounce and play on them because I mean they've now lived their best life they're in their senior years they've retired this is their sunbeam um, and they don't want you know the ruckus of a youngin so um, I guess if you're gonna try and find a friend just try and find them kind of closer similar in age so that they have similar you know exercise needs um, and energy needs if that makes sense and I might add to that a great place to get a cat. Hey, plug for the uh, Oakville Milton Humane Society um, <laughs> is, is, is a first step. Uh, the other nice thing about us is, you know, if you can give us an overview of what the personality of your cat is, then we can certainly help you to select something that might work for you. And, you know, maybe in the discussions that you have with one of our adoption counselors, they may say that they don't feel that your particular cat would really benefit from having a friend but i will put it out there that maybe your first step is to check us out because we might be able to find uh your friend a special friend of his own okay um i'm not sure how we'll be able to answer this one but i'll give her a go uh what can i do about my dog chewing the pads on his feet and legs he even gets to the point of bleeding we've been to the vet and they feel it is behavioral what can we do to prevent him from chewing himself well, my answer is I think uh, you have to talk with your vet again. And then if it's behavioral, then they truly have to help you um, with kind of behavior modification to stop that. And then you also have to figure out why it is behavioral. So what is stressing your dog out to the point that it's chewing and licking its feet? Um, and that's a tough one. So I would just keep asking your vet um, and then maybe it's time that you look into a veterinary behaviorist um, and see if they can help you as well. Um, will a pet version of CBD oil help to relieve a dog's stress and make them more mellow? Um, I That is a veterinarian question, but I, as far as I know, there still isn't any official veterinary approved um, CBD uh, or cannabis products like in Canada anyhow um, so that is definitely something to talk with the veterinarian about because the problem is um, I have done some courses and stuff on CBD but unfortunately not all products are 100% uh, CBD um, and sometimes there is THC which is the toxic form that makes it into these supplements and that's where you have the problem so before trying any type of CBD product, I would for sure pass it by your veterinarian uh, to make sure that it is safe. Uh, because sometimes some of these products, they may say that they are THC free, but they truly aren't. Um, so it's important that you ask your veterinarian because uh, THC toxicity isn't a fun one um, and uh, it will require lots of hospitalization. Okay. Um, how do you know what kind of enrichment is best for your pet? Well, it's all trial and error. Uh, when I was in shelter medicine, we, we learned it. Like each animal was 
different. So you just have to figure it out, unfortunately, um, and start simple. Like just you go like use like an empty, you know, McDonald's bag and throw a handful of treats and kibbles in it and like crunch up the top and see if your dog is interested in it. Um, and we'll rip it up and take the kibbles out. Or, um, you know, if some pets like simple things, like there's dogs out there that like thrive on the, you know, the difficult things and they love shredding boxes to get their treats, but some dogs literally you smearing some canned food on a lick mat and sticking that to the front of your fridge for 15 minutes, that's enough for them. So I think it's truly trial and error um, and trying different things. And I mean, start small. And then if you find that your pet is like, you know, wants more stimulation, then kind of broaden your horizons. And enrichment is fun and it brings so much joy to both like your pet and you. Cause like, I mean, who like who doesn't love watching their pet like be happy and tear things up um before i started at the vet clinic that i work at now they didn't really do a ton of enrichment um and they did have like a long-term boarding patient that was he just was overall depressed and i went in there one day and i threw a lick mat up on the wall and i threw some canned food on it that dog from the moment like it started with its enrichment that i was providing it completely different dog it ended up um was it was rehomed and it was a completely different dog by the time it left so enrichment does change how they feel so it just it really it depends on how um how your dog is and if they are kind of you know more in depth like if you have a border collie versus like a maybe a chihuahua they might want different things okay do you know much about cat massage as a stress reliever yeah there is um there are like different touch points on animals and you would have to probably do some more research because I don't know them specifically um, on where like stress relieving like points are, but cats can wear thundershirts um, and they do help with cats as well. So stressful situations, you can use a thundershirt, uh, but you're, you would have to do more research on the specific uh, pressure points for cats because I don't know off the top of my head, but it does work. And just to add to that, I mean, there are massage therapists out there for pets the same way there are for people. So it might be worth your while to find one of those who uh, has a particular specialty in cats um, and they could help you to determine whether it's right for your particular cat. Okay, is there a spray you can apply on a cat's or dog's fur or paws to get them to stop excessive grooming? uh probably not one that is enjoyable to taste um which i guess is the idea but that excessive grooming um is one of those things that you should always talk to your vet about because there could be a million reasons why unfortunately they're doing it uh so first step would be talking to their your vet about it um and unfortunately the answer might be for a short term time they're wearing a cone until you figure out why they're licking uh but there really isn't kind of a topical option to solve all the licking problems because trust me there's probably a million people out there that would love that especially if you have a pet that has allergies and licks okay um so how often and for how long do you recommend doing enrichment with your pet you could do enrichment um daily with your pet um you can also do different types of enrichment throughout the day with your pet like you could do you know, you could do a scent enrichment uh, with them, like spray their bed or something with um, a scent in the morning. And maybe you um, take them, you know, either to, train, to a training class or, a, you know, a, a long walk where you do some mental stimulation and training with them on a walk. Um, and then at night you quiet down with like a frozen Kong. Um, so you can, you can do like multiple different things in a day with them. I mean, usually you can tell when they've had enough when they're bored and they've like walked away from their toy and they're like, you know, I've had enough of this. Um, but you can do it daily and you can do it multiple times a day and you can do different types of things each day. Um, it's truly up to the pet and how much mental stimulation they need. Like I said before, like maybe, you know, a Great Dane might require less mental stimulation than say a Border Collie or an Aussie uh, would. Um, say with like a kitten might require more mental stimulation than a senior cat type thing. So it truly is up to 
how your pet reacts, but you'll know when they've had enough. They're going to probably walk away from a half-eaten Kong and be like, yeah, I've had enough. So you'll know, but you can try and mix it up and do every something every single day. Great. Well, Andrea, I think that's it for questions. There were a lot of them, and there were a lot of good questions, and they certainly tested your skills <laughs> in terms of coming up with answers on some of those. I was pretty impressed. Um, so thank you for that informative and enlightening presentation. I know I personally have lots of takeaways that I'm going to go home and play with my own pets at home with, and I hope um, everyone else found some tools that will be valued, valuable to them in some way. Um, thank you to Ryan from Skedaddle for being part of our mission to protect and make life better for animals and connect to people who care about them. We love the work that we do here at the Oak Hill and Milton Humane Society. We love knowing that vulnerable animals in our community will continue to receive the love, compassion, and care that is provided by the team here, and of course, made possible by all of you. If you've enjoyed tonight's presentation, we hope you will consider making a donation to the OMHS. You can make your gift online at omhs.ca. Our thanks to you, to all of you who donated and have joined us for tonight's presentation. Good night, everyone. Stay safe, and we hope to see you in the new year.